February 14, 1976, in Atherton, California. The interview is with Arnold Mitchell, son of Lucy Mitchell. I was interviewing somebody yesterday who was trying to get some sort of professional writing job, and she said, to her impression, there's no movement whatever in, in uh, jobs above the secretarial level. Mm. People are just hanging on. Mm. Well, that's, I think, true. Mm. When, when you started, do you remember how old you were when you started it? I was in part of the play groups then, right? Yeah, I was uh, less than three years old. I was put in there uh, straight out of the cradle, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, I was born uh, a couple of years after Banks Street was founded. About 1818? Uh, 1918. Yeah, it feels like 1818. <laughs> 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 Just a few years after Waterloo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Pretty funny. Yeah, and that, that was. Yeah, that was a pretty exciting time when, every, when the, everything was just getting started. Well, my mother uh, was starting up uh, Bank Street, and my father was starting up the National Bureau of Economic Research. And, uh, was that the time that he was commuting to Washington? No, yeah, or that was that, over by then? Yeah, that was during the war. Mm -hmm. uh, so they both had these big professional things that were getting started. Uh, my mother was 39 when I was born. I was the youngest of four. Mm -hmm. They say that always makes the most intelligent child. Oh, well, this is absolutely true. I'm sure it must be. It's quite clear. Yeah. Well, did you have help in the house? Did oh, yes. Yes. Uh, the woman who brought my sister and me up uh, was a lady whose name was Mary Irene Aloysius Carter Casey. Oh, my goodness. So we called her Molly. She was uh, really a, a mother during the early years. My sister was a year older and I mm -hmm. you know, lived up on the top floor. That's on 112th Street? Yeah. yeah. So when you went to the play groups, or, was it called City Country or anything? Yes. Did you just go downstairs or did you go out and around? There yeah, were three ways it to go. One was out and around and the two ways through. I did them all. Uh -huh. After that, three ways we go up through the attic. Did you go home for lunch? Yes. yes. See, the, the bureau, the uh, bureau uh, was uh, over the kitchen in the sitting country in those days. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and above the bureau grounds, a property room, uh, lived uh, Harriet Forbes and Johnson. Oh, they were there too? Yeah. I was aware of that. that. Yeah. And they had a daughter, right? Yeah, Polly. And uh, Polly was in one sense of a fifth child in the Mitchell family. That's the impression I get from your mother's autobiography. Yes. Do you know what happened or what she's doing now? Sure. She's uh, living on an island off the New England coast, as far as I know. Hmm. Uh, she married a uh, story who is a uh, psychologist or psychiatrist, I think. In the Boston Story family, and uh, they had three or four children, and the marriage broke up. And I hadn't seen Polly since uh, when my brother's kids was married in Maine, and they went back to the wedding. Mm -hmm. So I uh, She very much as I remember her, terrifically severe. She pulls her hair back like this. She's Russian. Oh. And she was a war orphan, right? Or is that a story I just heard? I don't know. Specifically, uh, it makes sense because I think there were three or four of them who were all orphaned at the same time mm -hmm. and then sent to various families in this country. And it wasn't until she was well, I've grown up. Oh, you mean she had brothers and sisters? Yes, that she discovered this fact and made connections with them. Okay. But can't you imagine what a thrill that must have been? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you too old, or you were along, came on to serve to be part of Harry Johnson's nursery school. That was just starting up when you were. Oh no. Were, were you ever part of the uh, Bureau of Nursery School? No, I don't think so. Uh, I was, went to a city country. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, 
Charlotte Windsor and uh, Jesse Stanton and Barbara Bible were teachers, taught me in the early years. Uh, I had no very distinct recollection of this at all. Mm -hmm. Did you get to know any of them as people in the course of your childhood? Not really, except for Jesse. And uh, we all knew Jesse very well and loved her very much. Why was that? I mean, why not why you loved her, but why, why did you have to get to know her? She was, she was around a great deal. Mm -hmm. and she and my mother had all kinds of personal uh, things going on between them. Mm -hmm. In addition to being professionally involved, and, uh, Jesse would be up in Greensboro, Vermont, with us in the summers a good deal of the time. She helped teach me German, which was quite an achievement. <laughs> what was she like? I haven't met her. Tremendously a brilliant, outgoing, uh, complicated person. That's a tremendous charm and warmth to her. And then down a couple of layers, all kinds of complicatednesses that made her fascinating as, as well, you see. And, uh, was she moody? Oh, sure. Who isn't? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. But uh, in the early days, why, uh, I wasn't aware of Bank Street at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, my recollections of my mother were uh, of her writing. Did she set aside certain hours in the day when you mustn't disturb her because no, she was writing? No, not so much. Uh, my father was a sacrosanct one in that respect. And during the mornings, he was at his desk, his gigantic George Washington desk. And uh, he worked to disturb father, to be very clear. And uh, mother would be, this was at 161 West 12, uh, my father had this huge room along with books jutted out into the yard of the younger yard of the school down below, and there was a bigger yard, and then diagonally across that was the place where the Bank Street was originally started, which was a... Uh, that was on 13th Street, you mean, the, the place where Bank Street was? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not where the library was yeah. that everybody met in. Yeah. So this, this is, as far as I can recall, you got into it through this fire door from the school, and it was a big gloomy room, just full of shadows and mystery. Your father's room you're talking no, about? No, I'm talking about the Bank Street. Oh, Bank Street. Yeah. And it's just full of shadows, and it's always seemed to me to be uninhabited. I didn't know what was going on in there. But you could look out of the window onto the yard there. And then from where we lived, which is across the 12th Street yeah. side of it, you see. Right. It seemed much brighter to me. Mm -hmm. And my father's room was a big dark, because, you know, books are dark. Yeah. Uh, but upstairs, when my mother worked, why, uh, she didn't have all of these books. And she always wrote uh, with sitting on a couch. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. And, uh, she was interruptible, <laughs> which father was not. Did, were you worried about what she was writing? Not really. Did she, did she do a lot of story reading to you, or storytelling? I don't seem to recall all that much of it, but I don't have a very full recall of my early years. I don't know just why. Did you have a feeling that she wasn't around very much, or...? Well, the time when she was around was in the summer. When um, you went to Greensboro? Yes. And uh, she used to write down in what used to be called the, the playroom there. It was off the shop. And originally, it was just open with cedar things. And had it built into it a, a sandbox in the very early years. And my mother and father used to it's sleep kidding. down there. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were very small, sometimes we slept down in another bed. And uh, tell stories of my sister Marnie, who was, as I said, a year older than I, um, being asleep down there, and a skunk came in. And then tried to get out and had the sort of banister effects that went like this, and Skunk got himself caught, caught. and uh, hanging there dribbled with this incredible stench. Do you remember that? Well, you could smell that smell 20 years later, no. and moisture hit it just right, oh, and put your nose down, it was really something. 
Does that mean it was the end of people sleeping down there? No. We did a glass it in and in the course of time. Uh -huh. And my brother Sprague now has a piece of property and he fixed it up very beautifully into a full fledged real house now. In those days it wasn't a tin roof and it was fun when the rain came and big racket. We put in a fireplace later and so on. But this is what, uh, the sort of thing that uh, I, as a uh, child, remember with my, my parents. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what about Mary Johnson? She must have been around at home sometimes, wasn't she? She was, and uh, I don't know when she died, you know? 34. I called her John, for Johnson. Oh, really? Yeah, and Harriet was little Harriet Forbes, who was a little tiny wizened. What did she do? Well, I didn't really know her professionally. Uh, she wasn't uh, uh, kind of inventive, professional person like Harriet Johnson and my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and I'm not clear what she did. Right? She had some library type jobs in the Polly uh, Fort Johnson container. What, what's your remembrance of Harriet Johnson? Was she an awesome kind of person? The recollection of her is that she was quite dark, smooth, uh, physically very soft. And uh, I think I must have sat on her lap as a little kid. So mm -hmm. and a tremendously lovely human being. It's my principal feel for her. Uh, you can trust her completely. And did. As a child. Yes. And I also recall very distinctly the, the grief that her death caused. In your home? Yes. She was, I think, tremendously close friend of my mother's. Yeah. And that's uh, rare, as you know. Rare for your mother or rare is between yeah. people? Yeah, between people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See, they were both personal friends and professional friends. Yes, yeah, so they did something together that was so unusual and Absolutely. important to them. But uh, there were some more things that Jerry might be able to do. I think it was really very kind of Were you aware of your mother's inspiring on other people as a child? We were talking about that before you turned on the tape as well. Uh, not as a child, no. I uh, got to know my mother after my father died, and uh, she was at Los Angeles, and she came out to California, mm -hmm. and lived out here for some years, and finally died after me. And this is the period in which you write an autobiography, and uh, we had a lot of association about that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was when I really got to know her. As a child, why, uh, I didn't have any notion that she was a, a big name and an important mm -hmm. person and all of this sort of thing. Had rather more that sent for my father. Um, Did your father have an appreciation of what your mother was oh, doing? Yes. yes. Certainly did. And rather considerable extent they were colleagues and they found in the bench. Mm -hmm. uh, they were tremendously different people. My father was a, a scholar, a student, a very uh, massive intellect kind of thing, and systematic, even statistical sometimes. I mean, we had an incredible fund of, of knowledge. Mm -hmm. and that if something came up, we'd always say, ask father, A, F. And my mother used to say that his initial to the WCM stood for well-controlled mind. Oh my God! It was this kind of uh, impressiveness. Mm -hmm. and mother, in contrast, you know, was this intuitive, gifted, creative, volatile sort of genius. You know, you better. Well, I wonder. I think but they appreciated each other. Yes, it did. Yeah, I, 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 I hardly think they talked Was Elizabeth there whenever at your home? Yes. I don't really have particularly recollections of it.
Have you talked to uh, either of my brothers? No. I've known to Brother John, yeah. but at the same time that I got in touch with you, so I have you know, not all I've talked, so I haven't had a reply yet. My problem is that I work full time and I have a family of my own. And so this I, this summer I don't yeah. have really free time to make appointments. What put you into this? Oh. Well, there must have been some. Yeah, actually, um, well, Barbara Barbara brought her home near us for the summertime, and we've been seeing her every summer for quite a while. And I teach school, and when Father Son came out with his articles in the New Republic about the English system of informal education in the uh, no, what are you talking about? infant schools, Everybody was so excited, and, and you know, but this was such a great new thing, and this is what we've been doing from Bank Street, you know, since the year one, and I was very annoyed. And then I went on a professional day to Bank Street in 1974, and I was talking to Fran Roberts, because I know him quite well, and he had all these diplomas on the wall, and I asked him if that's the story of his life, I was jesting, and he said, no, actually that was the story of Bank Street's life, and it was incorporation papers uh, from the Bureau in 1916 on up. And I said, you mean that's all there is? And he said, yeah, nobody's ever done more than that, except, of course, Mrs. Mitchell and two lives. And I said, gee, I'd love to do the history of Bank Street. And he said, be my guest. And we were both just, you know, making conversation, and I got so excited about it when I went home. And it was like one of those fortuitous things that one thing led to another, and all other things happened at once. And somebody was telling me about oral histories, and I have a friend that works in the special collections of the State University Library, and he pulled out of the file all the information about oral histories that the best people have put together, like Will Baum. And uh, I read it, and, I, and it sounded so great. And, and I went to Bank Street on a February day when I had a vacation and asked Wayne Dodsage if I could look at any of the archives and he gave me the key to the uncatalogued archives and I pulled them out to read at a table. And you wouldn't believe this, but in the few hours that I was sitting there, uh, Claudia Lewis came by, Bobby Fiverr came by, Charlotte Windsor came by, and they didn't even know that I was there, you know, what are you doing? And I was looking at them scrapbook that Elizabeth Healy had made of the first year at Bank Street. It was like a baby book, you know, the child is born and these were the parents and who was there. Delightful. And they just were so excited they hadn't seen that for 20 years more. So I was just trying to do a little research to find out about it, but since they were so thrilled, I had another vacation in eight weeks, and I started making appointments to talk to them about Bang Street during that vacation. Well, that's how it started. Mm. And it grew like Topsy, and mm -hmm. I haven't done anything about funding, because I don't know anything about it, and I don't like doing that sort of thing. I've just sort of been doing it on my own. So, and it gets more and more exciting as I go on. Mm -hmm. And I've read your mother's book about three times now, mm -hmm. you know, because each time I read it, I know more, and so I can understand more yes. what she's saying. Yes. So that's all. That's all Have right. you seen her other little autobiography that she dictated to the Berkeley people? Yes, it's in the collection at Columbia. Yes, it is. That's and that's great. in fact how I found out about Rosie Blivin, because yeah. she mentioned Sarah yeah. in there. And I haven't read it carefully. I have to go back and read it again. But that was one of the first things I did. I would like very much to get permission to read, you know, look at her papers. I know they're on deposit at Columbia. Oh, I don't. There's no problem about that. You're a legitimate scholar. Well, as I say, time has been my problem. Yes, yeah. okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. well, I haven't asked. I don't know whether there's a problem. With I don't that. think so. No. No, uh, if, if there is, I would like very much to hear about it. Okay, but as I say, they very That's crazy. the understanding. Yeah, I went to the oral history department and they gave me permission to read yeah. the translation. You're not allowed to go in there with a pen. 
They only allow pencils there. So afraid something will get damaged. It's really remarkable, you know, an interesting idea that mm -hmm. this is one way to prevent people from marking up yes. the archives. So, now you can do your <laughs> Um, If you have any anecdotes that you recall that might be of interest, you know, as a child, things, people that came through or things you overheard or saw? Well, I have uh, one anecdote which concerns uh, meeting with uh, John Dewey. Uh, I was born with a hearing deficiency, so one of the things we heard about was some doctor over in Paris who was supposed to have the magic for little deaf boys. So we took a ship over to... Uh, you and your mother? Yes. And characteristically, we were going uh, tourist class. Yeah, I heard she never took a taxi. She always took subways. <laughs> you know, she always had bulging paper bags and full things. Uh, but anyway, uh, on first class was a man whose name was John Dewey. So uh, they had been old friends from Chicago days. Uh, Dewey was a member of the first faculty at uh, Chicago. My father was a member of the first class in Chicago, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had this image of the bars separating first class and tourist class, my mother hanging on bars like this, chatting animatedly oh. about the two years, you see. And uh, what fascinated me about the whole thing was that Mr. Dewey had his, some kind of a stroke. And one side of his face was sagging. And, uh, I devoted myself to watching how the tears would well up very, very, very slowly in his eye. And uh, he wondered at what point it was going to spill over, you know. And I was just before I did my ego like this. And never did it spill over, and it was a big source of disappointment to me. This was my <laughs> contribution to the conversation. I don't know how old I was, but I, yeah, yeah. Do you remember the beach house that you had on Long Beach? Yes, of course. Yeah. Were the Deweys there, uh, Jason, I know that Stuart Chase is Stuart where Chase, a man by the name of Carlson. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stuart Chase was a very fine hockey player. The main thing I remember about him. Ice hockey? Or no. Oh. Field hockey. Yeah, field hockey on the beaches. Mm -hmm. We used to play King of the Castle down there. When did you go to that beach house? On weekends? Yes. Just to get away from the I guess. routine? I yeah. Was yeah. that a time when lots of people came with you, or was that... Yeah, well, sometimes. Well, there's a picture in my mother's book with all of these legs hanging over there. <laughs> remember that time? No, I don't yeah, remember that. Yeah, there are dozens of little kids it. there. So you had to find out by counting up all the legs and dividing by two to see how many guests you had. Yes, if you safe and assuming two per person. <laughs> no, we have to watch that, don't yes. we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Probably too much of an assumption. <laughs> oh, what's your impression of Carolyn Pratt? Was she, were you aware of her as part of the city and country school? Oh, was very she much so. Well, she was a principal and she was a terror. That's well, true. Whenever anything went wrong, well, you had to go and see Miss Pratt. And this was pretty thunderous stuff. <laughs> Who were your teachers there? She also asked me, you asked me a little earlier, whether Jesse Stanton was moody. Yeah. And I remember Caroline Pratt, I made some comments, said, what, are you moody? Oh, that's what Jesse Stanton was at City and Country then, wasn't she? And, uh, it was a bad thing to be moody. Oh. You said that to Caroline Pratt? No. Oh, no. I mean, she scared the life out of me. I didn't say anything to her. <laughs> said to Jesse. And what was her reaction when you said that? Well, that's just her way of putting me down. Oh, she said it to you? Yes. Uh, Bill Fink, you see, and uh, Hubie, Leo Huberman, the two people that I remember the best as teachers at the uh, city and country. And these were in my latter years there. How high up did city and country go? 13, age 13. Mm -hmm. It still does, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I so. visited there in December, and it's exactly the way it's described in Carol Pratt's book. It's uncanny. Do you remember playing with blocks and building with them? I certainly do. Is that an important part of your school life? 
you know, I, I must say that in retrospect, I have some sense of being spied upon and put in slots. But, uh, Why? Well, because that's what was happening. You know, we couldn't do anything without it being recorded somewhere. Oh, you knew that as a, even as a child? I know it now. Oh. Your mother did a lot of that too. Do you, were you aware of it when she, that she was aware of what you were saying? I don't know, but uh, I've since run across papers with describing Arnold and his constructions and things like this, and little brown photographs of things that I built when I was four years old. This sort of thing. Really? Mm -hmm. Which one of you was it that had to have the tetanus shot? Brother Spray. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. I just had to read that recently when I was looking over the book. That must have been an awful experience. That was indeed. It was traumatic. Yeah. Do you remember when your mother was so very ill and I had to be confined to her room for four months? No. No, you were very young then. That must have been very important. Well, thank you. If you think of anything else, you know, that uh, you can think of, but that's... I don't know. Uh, were there any kinds of things at school that you really liked? Uh, teachers, you know, we dream up all these things, but I'm really concerned about whether kids remember things and they're important to them. My recollections of my early years mm -hmm. in school are uh, not particularly positive. Mm -hmm. I remember getting into fights. With a chap whose name is Eddie Sermont. I was, I remember breaking my arm, I remember being promoted into my sister's class, and then uh, a big to do about that and being demoted. Oh no. And, and I remember having to sit out in the yard all one afternoon, weeping salt tears the whole damn time. It's a, it's a, no, they're not, they're not the lessons. Not in town very yeah. good, even with the block building. And I, I had no idea whether how other people would recall these times. The dancing, you said you had to go to that dancing stuff. Well, I kind of liked it because you could run around like a mad thing. Uh -huh. And I was a wild little kid, had a tremendous amount of energy. Was that upstairs in the yeah, sort of gym, gym room? Yeah. Imagine, especially with the hearing problem, that you need to have a lot of way to get a lot of that stuff out. I suppose. My brother Sprague has exactly the same problem. Yeah. The hearing problem? Yeah. yeah. What is it, a congenital problem? Yeah. 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 Were you helped by the doctor in your... No. No, there's no way to help it. What, what it the, the problem is that the little hairs in the cochlea would pick up so many things. Mm -hmm. I'm missing. So. I hate to interrupt, but Great. we can continue in there. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Peter Brand. And 
touching on his strange proclivities for certain types of desserts. He loves bean sandwiches. Bean sandwiches. We would have bean sandwiches and pita bread. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid that doesn't sound terribly appealing to me. But Are you supposed to do it with this on the top view? Or? Well, you can do it any way you want. I, I find it as much trouble to put it inside as, as to... Like my soupy old bread. Yes, it's uh, very more soupy. <laughs> Actually, I have I have uh, served it this way so people can make sandwiches out of it. See, you came on the uh, Which has proliferated extensively in the years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very few people knew that that name went on until 1952. Mm-hmm. You know, once they moved into Bank Street, it was Bank Street to everybody. Yeah. Well, it's a huge improvement over the National Bureau of Educational Research or whatever it was. Experiments? Oh, yes, some people regret that that wasn't invented. The Bureau is such an antiquated word now. Yeah, right. But it was the thing in World War I. Oh. All the government bureaus. That's where it came yeah. from. Mm. I, I think uh, Wellington uh, was uh, addicted to it. <laughs> Back in the 1800s. Mm. Mm. Well, that's where it I mean, the word got from the office once I really literally saw a sign that said, Time to extinguish all illumination before departing the premises. Really? That's famous. Mm-hmm. Yes. You didn't have a history? Or is it just. Well, I used it once as an example of how you would say something obscurely and not be correct. And a whole bunch of terrible literary errors in that famous sentence. Mm. So it is a famous sentence. Yes, I didn't it know is. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Along with the OPA regulation on setting the price of cabbage. Mm-hmm. And how did that go? Well, it's 50,000 words long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just federal ladies at its worst. Mm. The news men that now, I was just the other day on the news, they were talking about a sentence you know, on interregulation, and when the department was asked what that sentence meant, nobody could interpret the meaning. <laughs> it was about an export, something about it, a particular good being exported. It just confused everybody and made it tops. I guess that's the purpose of a lot of it, isn't it? That's why we've got judges in courts, right? Um, sure. Well, some of the things they pronounce aren't all that understandable. That's true. And he's a medical writer. Oh. Encounters quite a bit of this sort of thing. <laughs> we were talking only this morning. It's a preventive medicine or preventative. Mm-hmm. What does that the syllable do for you? Well, it's just that everybody says it so much that way that when you say preventive, it sounds as if you're wrong. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you don't say inventative. No, I mean, why should you say prevent? It's like people saying irregardless. Mm-hmm. Uh, so often that you begin to wonder, you know, if you're right after all. I've always been puzzled by the fact that flammable and inflammable mean the same thing. Mm-hmm. Are you doing? Mm-hmm. That's true. The opposite is non-flammable. Hmm. But inflammable means you can set it on fire. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Right. That's fine. For a response, it stops to think. I never thought about that very much, really. Mm-hmm. Did your parents instill in you feeling that a man's work and a woman's work were equally important? <laughs> Japan? Did they My parents? Yeah. Uh, I, well, I, it certainly was the way they acted, yes. Yes. I think the answer is yes. I don't know what they went about in still you know. Oh, well, yes, I meant in their actions or their way of life itself. Well, they hope for the dishes except for breakfast, is it? Remarks in the book. You remember I that? I didn't know that. No, I didn't read that. I mean, I remember mean, I mean, I mean, reading what he had for breakfast and that it was always at 8 o'clock and he was faithful to that hour. Yeah, he's pretty. 
Well, was there also a particular time when children were entertained or when there was a family hour? Did the children tell her? We were permitted uh, during in New York to, when my parents were dressing for dinner, which was quite common, father would take a bath. And we were allowed to room around and, and there and talk to them at this point. Mm -hmm. When they had formal dinner parties, were the children uh, so elsewhere? Usually, yes. You know, we used to eat in the kitchen you know, with Molly and Mrs. Schrager and other people of this sort. Molly didn't live in Connecticut, didn't she? When she did later. And she mm -hmm. married uh, Patty Casey. Happens also to have been Irish. <laughs> and uh, they met, uh, lived out in Stanford, yes. Was the Stanford house after you, the Vermont house, or, or when did you folks get the Stanford? The Vermont thing went right on straight through. Mm -hmm. yeah. They uh, bought the Vermont property in 1915 or something like that. And then when they were over in Europe for a year, they had it built various little rangy houses up there. Uh, Stanford property they bought I don't know when. Mm -hmm. uh, 10, 15 years later. And then uh, they built a house there uh, after living in their little farmhouse for some when they built their own house while Molly and Patty lived in the farm and ran the farm. And did the Harriets have a house there too? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Very nice little house. Yeah. Mm. It's really lovely how they accepted a lot of people into their lives. It's not usual. Yeah, that's probably true. Mm. Especially for people that were so busy, and, and their privacy must have been a very rare and important yeah. thing to them. Your mother had a strong sense of privacy. She used to complain her father had none. Yeah. <laughs> now, he would, in a sort of factual way, say anything that came up, you know, just to be quiet. <laughs> He wanted to learn about him. The thing to do was to be around him when somebody he didn't see very often would say, Well, Wesley, uh, what's going on? He said, Tell him. But articulately, condensively. Well, the idea that he kept a diary of, of his life always is, is, is an indication of that kind of a. You know, Have you seen a diary? No, I haven't. I've already read about it in one of his books. One of these little things, you know. Oh, that big? Yeah. Oh, he must have written very small. Yeah, yeah, very small. Eugene O'Neill <laughs> wrote, wrote a whole play on six pages. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> it was about a nine hour long play. <laughs> I trust you on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Connie says that some people refer to, uh, is it, morning becomes a like bird, uh, just an ordinary seven act play? Yeah, an ordinary nine, just an ordinary nine act play. Just an ordinary nine act play. I really am co-presenting O'Neill anymore because I took a collection of his works on time on a camping trip when everybody else was busy at a conference. And I read six or seven blends in a row and I almost committed suicide. And I've never had one very terrible. I have, not long ago, I read the, um, uh, the strange interlude. And I was fascinated by it. But uh, apparently I had all the wrong reactions to it because you're not supposed to think that the chief woman character is very real at all. And I thought she was fairly real. 
What were you doing? Were you lying from door to door, shaking trading? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, there was a gang on 11th Street. Well, you certainly haven't had to walk far to school, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. I don't think I was a very bright kid. You know, I was, felt, I guess, the weight of things on me and so on. It took me a long, long time to feel that I was all right. What was that? Because of being the youngest among four children, you think? Or the atmosphere of... So much intellect in the house. I don't know. All four of us had trouble this way. Famous parents often, uh, or very powerful parents often, seem to yeah. cause problems for kids exactly. for a long time until it takes them a long time to get past that. Right, precisely. Is it because parents are very demanding of themselves and their children, too, in a situation like that? Well, my parents were competitive people, and they compared. Mm -hmm. And then also your self-standards get so well, out of yeah. perspective, and you think that this is the way you're supposed to be when you grow up, and then you think, oh my God, you know, I'm never going to do it, so is there anything else? Uh, well, you were told now that you were not going to be that way. I, I fancy that all children have something similar to go through. I think so. Also, too, the era of private schools, I think, is really significantly different now than it was in those days. Mm -hmm. My, um, who was she, some number of great aunts of some sort, I don't know how many greats are in there, started one of the first nursery schools in the uh, Middle West, and it was in St. Louis, and she was named Miss I of all. And, um, the whole thing of the private school then, and such a, it was almost a, a whole lifestyle training, a character training and a, a commitment of saying, here's my child, and mm -hmm. you think of religion in a sense, as compared to just going off to a school. My family has uh, some of that history in it. My mother was trained as a kindergarten teacher. And, we found these things about this Ivy school, and they had things like they had walks in the open air, and we went outside, and they, I remember her um, number one teacher said to me when she was in her 80s, she said, I learned three things, you know, in my career, and I'd like to pass them on to you, but you felt it was a, it was a heritage of, the, um, of a religious sort more than simply a, a school, which I think makes it different from dealing with education. Now, I'm not well versed in private school in terms of knowing a lot, a lot of them, but uh, the ones that I have known and the people that I have known have conveyed that message to me so that a family living in that situation would be different from it is now. Oui. Just some years ago, but uh, my, ch my children in the peninsula school for a couple of years. Finally decided it would be better off in the Palo Alto regular school system. Mm -hmm. Partly because they have all of their little confreres around there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we made the switch, and then we regretted it. How old were they when they went there? Were they just first grade? Little ones? Yeah, kindergarten and first grade. Was Ida Sandpearl around then, or was that. He's, he's a wandering poet? Oh, I've heard of him. Yeah, not, not in those no. days. Do you remember any of the children that were in your classes? Were, were they competitive as well? Or was there a feeling in the, in the schoolroom that... Well, I had one very good friend. His name was Pat Verdery. And we were real buddies. And then the big opposition was Eddie Sumar. And uh, Eddie was one of these kids who came from the top part of town. And he knew how to bite better than I did. And uh, we exercised ourselves a great deal uh, every day, fighting. And, uh, came off about even, I guess, the uh, I don't know what's happened to Eddie, but didn't speak English so good and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. The fitness fingernails, so they were all wavy and strange looking. I've never seen anything like it before since. Mm -hmm. It was very weird. Mm -hmm. But I guess he was brought in as to 
exposed us genteel types to the material. Here is our level of punk. I wasn't I think the teachers had a feeling they were just sitting on a front of some of the time with some of the classes they had. Should we just walk over? I think we ought to leave with people and say thank you very much for giving us all this time.